right. It's good to see everybody this morning. Look forward to our time of worship together and pray for the Lord's blessing. Let's take our chorus books and turn toward the back on page 13. We're going to sing this hymn, Christ Died for Me. And then also we're going to sing, Oh, How Merciful, on page 14. When I was lost, all hope was gone. I couldn't find my way back home. My Lord heard me in my distress and showed me that he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me and now I'm free from Satan's bond and all because Christ died for me the love he has can there be told the price he paid to save my soul taking my guilt and all my blame and hung there in open shame Christ died for me on Calvary his precious blood was shed for me and now I'm free from Satan's bond and all because Christ died for me. The Savior hung on Calvary's tree. There in the place that belonged to me. Love held him there in agony. Paying my debt when he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond. And all because Christ died for me. A million years will just begin. Eternity will never end. Those nail-scarred hands will remind me of the debt he paid when he died for me. Christ died for me on Calvary. His precious blood was shed for me. And now I'm free from Satan's bond and all because Christ died for me. Yes, I was lost, but now I'm found. And by his grace, I'm heaven bound. My only hope, my only plea is that Christ died and he died for me Christ died for me on Calvary his precious blood was shed for me and now I'm free from Satan's bond and all because Christ died for me Lord certainly gifted Brother Hale to write these hymns true to Christ and the gospel, and I'm thankful. And that's where we're going to turn to page 14, another one that the Lord directed him to write, even though he's passed on, but we continue to benefit from what the Lord taught him. This one is, Oh, How Merciful. When I was lost in sin and shame, how thou let me take the blame blessed lord how merciful thou was to me when i could look down deep within 
and see the sinfulness of sin. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. A sinner lost and so hell-bent, yet thou sayest I must repent. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. I wonder why should I rebel with a soul deserving hell. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, <clears throat> how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful. Blessed Lord, how merciful thou wast to me. I'm not ashamed of all thy grace. When thou came and took my place, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. When this world ceases to be eternal blood to plead for me, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, how merciful thou art to me. Oh, how merciful, how merciful, blessed Lord, merciful thou art to me you can see how the Lord directed him to speak of what he has been and what he is and that's certainly the case eternal blood to speak for me blessed Lord how merciful Bob is gonna come read for us good morning Psalm 41 blessed is he that considereth the poor the Lord will deliver him in time of trouble the Lord will preserve him and keep him alive, and he shall be blessed upon the earth, and that will not deliver him unto the will of his enemies. The Lord will strengthen him upon the bed of languishing, that will make all his bed in his sickness. I said, Lord, be merciful unto me. Heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. Mine enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die? and his name perish. And if he come to see me, he speaketh vanity. His heart gathereth iniquity to itself. When he goeth abroad, he telleth it. All that hate me whisper together against me, against me do they devise my hurt. An evil disease, say they, cleaveth fast unto him. And now he lieth, he shall rise up no more. Yea, mine own familiar friend, in whom I trusted, which did eat my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. But thou, O Lord, be merciful unto me, and raise me up, that I may requite them. By this I know that thou favorest me, because mine enemy doth not triumph over me. And as for me, thou upholdest me in mine integrity, and hast settest me before thy face forever. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel from everlasting to everlasting. 
Amen and amen. May we pray. My gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to read your word, dear Lord, knowing that it, this particular passage deals with the death and the resurrection and betrayal, dear Lord, and that it is complete with our Lord Jesus Christ sitting beside the right hand of the Father, dear Lord. To him be all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. We know that that portion has to do with Christ because certainly he said that, mine own familiar friend in whom I trusted, which did eat my bread, hath lifted up his heel against me. That was Judas. And some are troubled or confused or perplexed, especially what Bob read there in verse 4 when I said, Lord, be merciful unto me, heal my soul, for I have sinned against thee. How did the Lord own the sin of that people that the Father charged to his account? Well, he owned it as his, but it was by imputation. And therefore, his prayer to his Father was on behalf of of those that he was representing. He had no sin of his own, nor was he ever made sinful. But when the scriptures say that his soul was made an offering for sin, it was made the sin offering. And so when he's praying here, when he says, I have sinned, he's speaking on behalf of that people that the Father gave him. And he was numbered amongst transgressors, but he had no sin of his own. He was never made sinful. So that's a precious portion for us to consider all that Christ has done for such sinners as we are. Well, let's take our bulletins and on the inside cover, we're going to sing this tune to majestic sweetness sits enthroned. You'll notice I've been putting in some of these psalms that have been taken from a psaltery. It's called a psaltery, an old Scottish psaltery. And I'm endeavoring to find some tunes that we can sing that these words go with. So that's what this one is. This one's based on Psalm 71. And Robert is going to come read for us. Good morning. Ruth 3, the reading of the Lord's word. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee, that it may be well with thee? And now is not Boaz of our kindred? with whose maidens thou wast. Behold, he went with bar barley tonight in the threshing floor. Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiments upon thee, and get thee down to the floor. But make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. And it shall be, when he lieth down, that thou shalt mark the place where he shall lie. And thou shalt go in and uncover his feet, and lay thee down. And he will tell thee what thou shalt do. And she said unto her, All that thou saith unto me, I will do. And she went down unto the floor, and did according to all that her mother-in-law bade her. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk, and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of corn. And she came softly and uncovered his feet and laid her down. And it came to pass at midnight that the man was afraid and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. And he said, Who art thou? And she answered, I am Ruth, thy handmaid. Spread therefore thy skirt over thy handmaid, for thou art a near kinsman. And he said, Blessed be thou of the Lord, my daughter, for thou hast showed me kindness in the latter end than the beginning inasmuch as thou followest not young men whether poor or rich and now my daughter fear not I will do to thee all that thou requirest for all the city of my people doth know that thou art a virtuous woman and now it is true that I am thy near kinsman howbeit there is a kinsman nearer than I tarry this night and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could, could know another. 
And he said, Let it not be known that a woman came into the floor. Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she, when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and she went into the city. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. And she said, These six measures of barley gave he me. For he said to me, Go, not empty unto thy mother-in-law. Then said she, Sit, down, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall. For the man will not be in rest until he have finished the things this day. Let's pray. Father, we come before you now and we praise you. Lord, we thank you for the gospel of Christ today, as always. Lord, we pray that, uh, that we be like Ruth, at that we abide at Christ's feet, because he is our rest and our refuge. We thank you for the pictures of types of Christ and his church in the reading of the word today. Father, we ask you to be with Brother Ken as he delivers the word. We pray that we hear Christ's voice in that message today. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. What a precious portion. Go oh, as a type of Christ. Ruth the Moabitess, type of his church, on whom God has had mercy. Let's take our hymn books and turn to hymn number 172. We'll stand together and sing this. O Word of God Incarnate. O Word of God Incarnate, O Wisdom from on high. O truth unchanged, unchanging, O light of our dark sky, We praise Thee for the radiance That from the hallowed page A lantern to our footsteps Shines on from age to age. The church from her dear master Received the gift divine And still that light she lifteth O'er all the earth to shine It is the golden casket Where gems of truth are stored it is the heaven-drawn picture of Christ the living Word. It floateth like a banner before God's host unfurled. It shineth like a beacon above the darkling world. It is the chart and compass that o'er life's surging sea, mid mists and rocks and quicksand, still guides, O Christ, to thee. O make thy church, dear Savior, a lamp of purest gold. To bear before the nations Thy true light as of old. O oh, teach thy wandering pilgrim By this their path to trace Till clouds and darkness ended They see thee face to face. Amen. You may be seated. What a glorious hope. See him face to face. David's going to come and read for us. John chapter 15 verses 3 through 11. Now you are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. 
If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit. So shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, if ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. Father, we thank you for Christ. Without Christ, we're all lost in our sin with no hope of salvation. Open our hearts that we may understand your word. In his name we pray. Amen. Well, I asked David to read all the way down to verse 11, but I'll set everybody at ease because I know some are probably thinking he'll never get there. There's a lot here, and so I actually don't plan to get to verse 11. Lord willing, I'll preach from this portion, verse 3 down to verse 6. But I've got a great subject, and I've entitled this A Fruitful Vine. What we're considering here, and we saw it last time, where Christ, they've already left. Remember up in verse 31, they've left the upper room. They're on their way now to the Garden of Gethsemane. And on the way are these plants, these trees, vines, vineyards. And that's where the Lord takes this occasion to teach his disciples and telling them, as we saw in verse 1, I am the true vine. This was an image or imagery that the Jews could well understand because in the Old Testament, that Jewish nation was called God's vineyard. But it was only in a natural sense. God preserved the Jewish nation for one reason, to bring his son through that nation. But when he came to his vineyard, it's like the scriptures say, he came unto his own, but his own received him not. Our Lord told parables about the vineyard, where initially he'd sent his servants, his prophets, and they'd taken and slain them. And now the son came, and when he came, they said, this is the heir, let's kill him. And yet none of that changed God's purpose. And this is important for us to see. As much unbelief as there is in the world looking around, there's not one thing that is taking place but what God has purposed. And that Christ as the vine, and we saw last time in verse 1, the father being the husbandman, that this is a successful vine. That's what I want us to see. There's nothing apart this, about this vine that has any sort of fallacy that in the end now, God wanted one thing, but alas, he was not able to accomplish it. That's why I've entitled this a fruitful vine. And I know we're gonna look at a portion here that some read and say, well, it says down there in verse six, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch and is withered, and men gather them and cast them in the fire, and they're burned. There are some that look at that as being a type of, well, if you don't keep abiding in Christ yourself, then you're going to be cut off and cast away and burnt. We're going to look at that scripture. That's why I don't believe we'll be able to make it much farther than that in verse 6. So just hold that thought. Put that in the parking lot. There's an answer. It in no way affects the vine. It in no way affects what God, the father purpose concerning his son as the husbandman. We see the beautiful picture there between the husbandman who was the caretaker of the vineyard and the vine, which is Christ. A beautiful harmony between the work of the father and the son in the salvation of sinners. That's who this vine is about. And that's why we saw last time in verse 2, every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And we looked at that word. It actually means to lift up. Just like a vine caretaker, vineyard caretaker would go. And when they see a branch laying so low to the ground that it can't produce fruit, it's propped up. That's really what that word means. We saw that in the Greek. Another way is... He'll take it up. He'll take it away from the ground. Might be another way 
of looking at it if you're troubled by the translation. But that's literally what Christ is saying. Because he's the vine. And every branch notice, it says, in me. So it's very clear here that he's speaking of those that are in him. By God's electing grace. Remember, the father's the husbandman. In him, by Christ's coming and doing this work on behalf of that people that the father gave him. And that's what our Lord is preparing these disciples for. Just in a little time, he would be lifted up himself <laughs> and uh, on behalf of that people that the Father gave him. So you can see everything about this picture here has to do with success. And that's why I love preaching this. Christ is the successful Savior. He himself said that, that of all that the Father gave him, he should lose what? Nothing. What part of nothing don't you understand? Nothing. But I'll raise him up. There's a picture again. Lift up. I'll raise him up in the last day. And so as we go on here in this portion, that's what I want us to see. How this vine, being a representation of Christ and his church, the branches, the branches just don't grow on their own. No, it's out of the vine that these branches grow, and out of the branches come the fruit. The fruit isn't creating itself. It's like the branch doesn't create itself, but it comes from the root. It comes from the vine, and that's an imagery that even Paul uses when writing to the Colossians, that we've been rooted and grounded in him. That's the picture here of, of the vine. But when it says there, as we saw, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, all of us can look back on our spiritual life and see times and seasons where there hadn't been much evidence at all that we're even children of God. If you want to look at the fruit, it's just nothing but a branch. But it's still not a dead branch. And the Lord is always going to assure that in its season, Every bit of fruit that he has ordained. It's not up to us. It's not like you can sit down and say, well, I, I better get bearing more fruit here for the Lord. There are times and seasons when if some were to pass by, they see a branch, it's not dead, but there's no fruit on it. Well, that's the work then of the husbandman. That's his work to deal with this vine and this branch so that it does bear fruit to the glory of Christ. And how does that take place? Well, the first thing that I note here, there's two elements to fruitfulness when you talk about a fruitful vine. And the first we see right here in verse 2, where it says that every branch that beareth fruit, he what? Purgeth it that it may bring forth more fruit. There's the fruitfulness. There's no concern for me if I'm in Christ that I'll ever end up being one of these branches that is cut off and cast away and burnt. That's not who's being described. Here it has to do with those that are in Christ and the word that's used here for purging those of you that are specialists in taking care of plants and other things, you know that every once in a while you got to go and clip certain little sprouts off here and there. But you're the one doing it. And why are you doing it? That that plant might better grow and flourish. Well, that's really what this word means here. He purgeth it. He's not cutting it off. But it's the word from which we get the word pruning. And in other places in scripture, this word purge here is translated cleanse, to cleanse it. You're not killing the vine by purging, by clipping and cleaning is what this is. Little sprouts that tend to grow out where the husbandman, again, who is directing all this? It's the husbandman. This matter of salvation is between the father and the son. Of which, if we're in him, and again I come back to that, 
In verse 2, that's the context. Every branch in me. This is not talking about people professing to be Christ's. In fact, they're represented down here in verse 6 that we're going to get to in a little bit. They're not part of the vine. Never have been. That might come as a surprise. And I'm kind of giving away here verse 6. So if you miss the rest and, and don't get that, you'll get it here. Notice down in verse 6, it says, If a man abide not in me, does your Bible say he shall be cast forth as a branch? No, it says he is cast forth as a branch. And if you go back and look in the Greek, the tense of that is he already has been cast forth as a branch, as not being a branch, as not being a living branch. He never was part of that's like the husband going down through. Here's the vine. Here's his, the vineyard. Here's, here's his people, his branch. But over here are all these little renegade dead plants. Have no life in them. What do you do with them? You take them, you cut them down, and you cast them into the fire. So we can be settled here to know that when this is talking about these it says, if a man abide not in me, it means he never was in Christ. You can't be in Christ and not abide in him because he's the one keeping you. So if any man abide not, there are a bunch of people that are professors to say they're in Christ, but they're not in him. These are the ones that Christ spoke of when he said, in that day many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? Have we not done many mighty works in thy name have we not cast out devils in thy name well we see all that going on but what does Christ say of them depart from me ye workers of iniquity I never knew you that's not his people that's not his vine that's not these here of whom he's speaking that he says that every branch that beareth fruit I'll guarantee you this that if Christ paid your sin debt and taught you of him you are the fruit <laughs> you're the branch and you are the fruit it's the fruit of his work that he's done and he will have everyone for whom he paid the debt that's a glorious subject right there just looking at that and so when it speaks here of pruning or cleansing that was the work of the vine dresser to clean up the fruit bearing vine so that it would even produce more fruit you can try to describe that however you want to but i know in my life ever since the lord taught me of himself the picture of him the glory of him continues to grow grow in grace and the knowledge of the lord jesus christ is the way it's put there well how do you grow in grace but through the knowledge of the lord jesus christ the more he teaches us of himself the more glorious that grace appears, doesn't it? And we realize that if I'm anything, it's because of who he is. Were this in any way dead wood, and there's no, there's no dead wood on this vine. That's what I want you to see here. The dead wood in verse 6 has to do with another branch. It's like in the parables, the Lord talked about the wheat and the tares. This represents the tares. Tares don't become wheat. Wheat don't become tares. Dead wood does not fall off of a living vine. It's dead because it never has been attached to the vine. So keep that in mind. And we can look at, if you will, different ways that the Father is pleased to prune this vine. It represents the church. How does the Father cleanse? You say, well, I thought we were already cleansed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, we are. That's what it says there in verse 3 as you continue down through there. When he says that every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, he cleanses it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Then you fall on verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So he's telling them it doesn't mean that they're not clean as being in him. They are. 
But this reminds me of when Christ stooped to wash the disciples' feet. And he came to Peter, and Peter halted. And the Lord told him, Peter, if I don't wash your feet, you have no part in me. And the Lord said, uh, Peter said, well, then wash all of me, top to bottom. And he said, you're already clean through the word, through who he is, the word. And I believe that's how we read this here in verse 3. Now ye are clean through the word. That's Christ. We just sang that before the message. Oh, word of God incarnate. That's the word of God. How has God ever spoken to a sinner but through Christ, the word? How has any sinner ever been made clean, holy clean, but through the word? That's speaking of Christ, his person, his work, his death. In him we're redeemed, we're sanctified, we're justified, glorified. That's good news. That's what he's declaring there. Remember, he's on the way to the cross. And he's seen each one of these as ones for whom he would pay the debt. What a motley crew. But aren't we all? Nothing but sinners. And yet, in this vine, fruitful unto his glory. It doesn't, you don't hear, you don't go by a, a, a tree or a vine like this and hear the fruit saying, aren't we something? Have you noticed me lately? It's just hanging there. It's waiting for the husband to come and take it and to make whatever it is he's going to make of it. And then that vine produce more. You think about all down through the history of the church, those that have gone before. And for a while, they were produced and hanging on that branch, and then the Lord took them off. But guess what? Here comes some more. That's the way it's going to be down through history. The Lord's always going to have his remnant. He's always going to have his people for whom he paid the debt. And I believe that that's what we see here. What are the instruments of, of the pruning? Well, we know God the Father. That's what it says up there in, in verse 1. I am the vine, my Father is the husbandman. So when he says there, he purgeth it, that's the work of the Father to do. He, from the beginning, saw his son as that one who would come and pay the sin debt of his people. And uh, he's the one that sowed that seed in the womb of Mary and brought him forth as a seed planted in the ground that would grow up and be cut down and then run through the mill, all that type and picture of Christ. But it was the husbandman overseeing it all. That in the end, this fruitful vine bring forth the fruit unto the Father. That's what Christ said. Everything he did was to the glory of the Father. But at the same time, in this pruning, as I said, it's the word. Some ask me sometimes, they say, well, is that talking about the written word? Or is that talking about the revealed word and, and the incarnate word? Yes. <laughs> because the written word is the incarnate word. That's why everywhere we turn, we're, we're looking for him. We're looking for him. We see him in the vine. We see him in the in the plant that the father, the husbandman, is overseeing. And he is that word, like we saw in verse 3. But at the same time, when you think about pruning, you think of a knife, different instruments that were sharp, that would take and cut and prune. The purpose isn't to destroy the vine. That, that's not it. But I think of the pruning knife of afflictions. You think about our Lord about ready to go to the cross. You talk about this man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And Christ had already said that if they hated me, they'll hate you. And uh, that the disciple is not above the master. If the master suffered, we can expect that we're going to have to take up this cross and follow him. There's the pruning, which I understand to be the weaning away from this world. And the Lord uses afflictions. You wonder sometimes, if I'm a child of God, why am I going through all of this trouble and trial and affliction? That's the Father's pruning. His purpose is not to destroy you. He'll not destroy anyone for whom Christ died. But yes, there is that pruning process. If you look back in Psalm 119, 
which is all about the word. But in Psalm 119 and verses 67 and 71, look what the psalmist says here. Before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now have I kept thy word. And when it says kept thy word, think of Christ the word. Think of those little sprouts that grow off even a living plant. You look at them and you think, now they're growing, but that's not the purpose for which that plant exists. So you come along and see, you're the one that determines. You clip it off. And if that plant could cry or speak, it might say, ooh, that hurts. But you're doing it to make that plant as you have determined it should be. I believe that's the picture here. Were there not this pruning or disciplining whom the Lord loves, he chastens, were there not that, we would all go our own way, just like here. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. Well, what was the purpose of the affliction? Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. That's the shepherd's rod and staff pulling back that sheep that would wander. And also over in verse 71, what does the psalmist say? It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I might learn thy statutes. Now the affliction itself is not pleasant. That's how the writer of the Hebrews put it. I don't know anybody that the hand of the Lord's on and afflicting and bringing through a trial, pruning, that somehow they're going, oh, that feels good. There are many dark days sometimes. You say, why, if I'm a child of God, how come these times are so dark? Well, it's the Lord doing the pruning lest we should put any confidence in this flesh. And to me, this is the greatest example of the fallacy of those that say that as God's children, we're getting better and better. Were that the case, you wouldn't need pruning. It's just the opposite. Left to ourselves, we would certainly fall away. There's nothing good in this flesh. Paul declared it. But what we need is these times of pruning by the Father. And therefore, it's done in love. And so that's why coming back here, Christ said here in my text, you're already clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. So he is the word. And the cleansing has to do with his death. He's already taught him about that. And now as he prepares to go to the cross, he's reminding them that this ongoing process, though they would be clean by him in his death, yet there would be this ongoing pruning necessary, lest uh, they should put any confidence in the flesh. You see that all the way through scripture. If we had the time, we'd develop that even more. We've been purified in our souls by the truth, that's what Peter spoke of there in 1 Peter 1, and yet we need to be purified even as Christ is pure. And he spoke of that, that hope that we have in 1 John 3, 3. So keep that in mind. It, it, there's, no, there's nothing in this flesh just because we've been justified and sanctified in Christ that somehow now in this flesh we're perfect. Just the opposite. This flesh is just as sinful as it ever has been. And that's why we need this pruning. We are washed, is the way Paul wrote it to the Corinthians there in 1 Corinthians 6. And yet there is that constant need that he who has washed us from our sins should daily wash our feet. Because we walk through this world. We get dust on it. But he's that servant. It's like they had servants in households that when people would come from a distance walking, the first thing they did was go over and have you sit down and grab a bowl of water and wash your feet. Oh, I needed that. It doesn't change your standing. You're received into that house. You're a friend, your family. But oh, how we need to have our feet washed. So that's the purging whole message in of itself. But the second element here in verses 4 and 5, 
is the, the element of fruitfulness is the abiding. Just like there's that purging in order that we might produce more, be more fruitful to his glory and honor, there is also that abiding, that apart from being in Christ, there is no fruit. But abiding in him, oh, how fruitful. That means his spirit is constantly working in, through, and by. The work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he says here in verse 4. Abide in me, but notice, and I in you. It's, it's almost as if saying, abide in me even as I am in you. Because that's the only way anybody can abide. And there the Lord emphasizes this mutual relationship that there is between him and those for whom he paid the debt. It's not only the disciple that abides in the master, but it's the master abiding in the disciple. How can I say I'm his other than that he abides in me and therefore I in him? I believe this is something close to what Solomon was describing there in Song of Solomon, if you turn back there. Here's where you see all of Scripture points to Christ. So if you turn back to Song of Solomon, right after Ecclesiastes, here in chapter 6, in verse 3, look how the bride puts this here. This is the special one of Solomon's affection, which is a type of Christ. It says, I am my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. He feedeth among the lilies. That's how he sees himself as the, the flowers grow, and he's feeding among those lilies. But there's that relationship. I'm my beloved's, and my beloved is mine. That's the Lord Jesus Christ here in my text, verses 4 and 5, giving us that picture to assure his disciples, they're about to face a very devastating time. That's why he already told them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. To see him crucified. And as the shepherd was smitten, the, the sheep scattered. And yet in none of that did he ever take his eye off of them. And, of them, and, and no time were they ever separated from him. Even though he wasn't physically present as he went to the grave and died. Nor even now as he's ascended in high. Remember, he taught his disciples, I'll send you another comforter, his spirit. That where I am, there ye may be also. All of this is descriptive here of what it is to abide in Christ. I mentioned last time, if I were to ask you, where do you abide? Well, there's different places. We stay at our office. We might stay in a hotel. That's not home. As pilgrims going through this world, there are different places where we might camp down, but that's not our abiding. Our abiding is Christ himself. And to abide means to dwell. It means to remain in him. But again, think of the branch and the fruit. That's not something the branch is doing, clinging on to the vine. It's not us holding him, it's him holding us. And so that's the picture here. It shows us that fellowship that there is between Christ and his people. To abide in him. To dwell in him. Where you abide, you rest. You eat. You dwell. You commune. Therein is the fellowship. A lot of people have misinterpreted and used and abused Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20. But if you look over there. You'll see the context. A lot of preachers use this to say that Jesus is going around knocking on sinners' doors and won't you please let me in. And you've seen that abominable portrayal of an artist that has, it's interesting, Christ is the light and yet has, has him holding a lamp in it. And then he's knocking on a door and you look down, the artist didn't even put a handle on Christ's side. So the picture is somehow if you don't open the door, then he can't come in. That's not it. Revelation 3.20 has to do with Christ's affection for his church. 
And that's who's being described here in this portion of Scripture, these different churches to whom he writes. And here was the church of Laodicea. This was a congregation that, again, needed pruning <laughs> because these were the Lord's. And he portrays himself there because he says in verse 19, you notice that, as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. That's the pruning. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. That's the fruit that he produces, more fruit, that repentance unto God. It's not, repentance isn't just a one-time thing. Faith isn't just a one. It's a continual looking to Christ. Turning from myself to Christ. That's what repentance is. That's the pruning. Were that not done, we would certainly turn to ourselves. But look at verse 20 in this context. Behold, I stand at the door. Whose door? The door of his people. That's who he fellowship with, fellowships with. And knock, that he does by his spirit. And when it says, if any man hear my voice, that word if can be translated, when any man hear my voice and open the door. That's the consequence of hearing his voice. It's not if he open the door. No, when he hears it, he'll open the door. I dare say if you hear a knock on the door at night and uh, you say, who is it? And you hear the voice of one of your loved ones that's knocking at your door, you're going to get up and open it. That's the way it is. We would slumber. We would sleep were it not for Christ coming and knocking on this heart's door and we'll open it and receive him and welcome him. And that's what he's describing there. I'll come to him and will what? Sup with him and he with me. This is not talking about Christ trying to get into the heart of sinners anywhere. No, this is talking about him with his people. And that's what that pruning process is all about. When you come back here in verses 4 and 5. Abide in me and I in you, even as I am in you. As the branch, what? Cannot bear fruit of itself. That shows it's not me holding him. Except it abide in the vine. No more can ye except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Why does he keep coming back to that? Because this all is dependent upon him. My saving, my keeping, my cleansing. I'm the vine. Ye, that are, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. There he says it again. It's to remind us that this is not something we do. It's what he does in us. For us and through us. The same what? Bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. Oh, well, that's a blessed truth right there. To know that this vine is ever fruitful. Because of who Christ is. And so then we come to verse 6. What about these here? Where it says, if a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch. What he's doing is describing those that aren't abiding in him. Never have. Those for whom he is not the vine. And therefore, left to themselves, there's nothing but deadness. It's describing people that they might have a religious profession. They might even, as we know today, use the name of Christ. Jesus this, Jesus that. That's no evidence that they're in the vine. I want to hear from a sinner how it is that they say they're the Lord's. And if they can't testify that I'm the Lord's only by for one reason, the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ, and His grace alone, if that's not their testimony, they're not in the vine. And if the Lord leaves them there, they'll be as these here. It says, when it says He is cast forth, they've already been cast forth. This is talking about those that God has purposed to condemnation. There are those he's purposed to save. They are in the vine. But if any man abide not, the reason they don't abide, never have, is because Christ has never been their dwelling place. He's never been their representative. Never been their substitute. And therefore, left to themselves, all they can do is wither whatever profession they had. This, this would be describing those that built their house on the sand. When the storm came, when the final judgment comes, they'll all be condemned. Just like you take dead branches, 
gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. That's the end a result of those that are not in the vine. It's not those that were in the vine but now somehow are cast forth. No, he's describing, again, it's the difference between the wheat and the tares. That's the picture here. They gather and throw them in the fire. Over in Jude chapter 1 and verse 4, and I'll close with this. I know people are appalled when you say, well, you mean there's some that God has ordained to condemnation? Yep. If you haven't seen it yet in scripture, slow down, read more carefully because it's in every place you look. Where there are sheep, there are goats. Where there are his elect, there are reprobates. Where there are the vessels of mercy, and that's who's being described in the vine, there are what? Vessels of wrath. Here, I don't know how it can be put any more plainly in Jude chapter one, Jude's talking about contending for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. That's Christ. That's the gospel. But look at here in verse 4. For there are certain men crept in unawares. What does your Bible say? Who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. They've always been dead branches. Cluttering up the vineyard. And what happens to them? They're taken and gathered and they've already been cast away, cast out. Ungodly men, what do they do? Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. You know what? All you need to do to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness is to add one element of man's works to it. Christ did this, but it still takes, there you go. You're turning the grace of God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing that we can add to his work. All the work is his. And I'm thankful to be one of those branches. How the Lord ever purposed that I should be of that branch, that's his, his determining. But all I know is it's him holding me, not him, me holding him. And for as long as he's pleased to have me be of that fruit, to hang there on that branch, and then when the season comes and that fruit is harvested, in other words, taken home, where does, what does a husbandman do when they harvest the fruit? They're not throwing it on the ground. They're taking it home to the granary or whatever they do. Well, I'm thankful that everyone for whom Christ paid the debt, that's our final home. And uh, he is definitely the fruitful vine. All right. We made it down to verse 6. Lord willing, we'll pick up from there next time and look further at what it is to abide in him. But for now, let's take our hymn books. We'll stand and sing this together. And this is a great hymn to sing now that we have heard what we've heard. How is it any are saved? By the blood of the crucified one. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Now ransom from sin and a new work begun. Sing praise to the Father and praise to the Son. Saved by the blood of the crucified one. Save, save my sin are all pardoned my guilt is all gone save save I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one saved by the blood of the crucified one the angels rejoicing because it is done a child of the father joint heir with the son saved by the blood of the crucified one save save my sins are all pardoned my guilt is all gone Save, save, I'm saved by the
the blood of the crucified one. Say by the blood of the crucified one. The Father he spake, and his will it was done. Great price for my part and his own precious son. Say by the blood of the crucified one. Say, say, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Say, say, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. Say by the blood of the crucified one. All hail to the Father, all hail to the Son, all hail to the Spirit, the great three in one. Say by the blood of the crucified one. Say, say, my sins are all pardoned, my guilt is all gone. Say, say, I'm saved by the blood of the crucified one. I don't know who S.J. Henderson was. He's the one that wrote it. It says 19th century. But it seems like he was taught of the Lord. Maybe one of those that was a fruit beyond before we even ever existed. And the Lord made him part of that branch and then has taken him on. More fruit to replace. That's a beautiful thing. All right. Everybody have a good day and we'll look forward to next time. Lord willing.